Buenos dias. Good morning, everyone. My name is Caroline Gonzalez Scott. I'm Vice President of Programs and Alumni Affairs at CHCI. Thank you for joining us. Welcome all to today's second policy briefing titled Equity in the Digital Age, Unpacking AI's Consequences for the Latino Workforce. Our moderator for today's panel is Karen Suarez Jimenez, CHCI's postgraduate law fellow sponsored by Pepsi. Karen is a proud indigenous woman from Oaxaca, Mexico, and was raised in Janesville, Wisconsin. She holds an undergraduate degree from St. Norbert College and a JD from the University of Wisconsin Law School. Notably, Karen is, Karen is also a DACA recipient. For the past several months, Godin has been supporting the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs and Chairman Brian Schatz. Her work with the committee spans across various areas, including public safety and law enforcement, economic development, and artificial intelligence. Please welcome me. Welcome me. <laughs> welcome. I mean, join me in welcoming Godin. Gosh, I couldn't get that out. <laughs> Good morning, everyone, and thank you so much, Caroline, for those introductory remarks. I am so grateful to have this opportunity as a CHCI postgraduate fellow and to present in a series full of impassioned and dedicated individuals. Welcome to today's second session of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus Institute Capitol Hill Policy Briefing Series. My name is Karen Itzel Suarez Jimenez, and I'm the 2023-2024 CHCI PepsiCo Law Fellow. This briefing is definitely a hot topic, not just here on the Hill, but in every corner of every sector. I'm sure that I am not the only one whose portfolio has been touched by AI policy. That being said, I am incredibly grateful and excited to moderate today's panel alongside our expert panelists who will provide insight into their experiences interacting with and implementing AI and how AI will not only affect their sectors, but the sectors they interact with concerning the effects on the Latino community. It is a privilege to be joined by these amazing folks for this discussion, and I'd like to start by thanking them and you all for joining us today for this conversation as we discuss an urgent and significant topic. Today, we will be discussing AI. While the concerns and conversations on AI may seem very new, in the public sphere, we've all been using AI for so many years now. If you've used maps on your phone to reach a destination, you've used AI. If you've been on Netflix and adhere to the recommendations, you've interacted with AI. But there's no mistake that in the last decade, AI has made leaps and bounds in its applications in everyday life. Now, let's narrow our focus to the effects of AI on the Latino workforce. These effects are inevitable and will be profound. We need to prepare our communities for the impact that AI will have and how to best regulate these effects in a way that complements and benefits workers. To set up the stage for today's discussion, let's take a step back to review and consider several things, three buckets or overall themes that I'd like to highlight. The first generally and broadly is exploring AI. And for that, we're gonna look at generative AI, natural language processing and machine learning. I promise I'll come back to define those. The second bucket or overall theme is the importance of AI literacy and education. And our third bucket um, to consider are policy and private sector recommendations for best practices in implementing and using AI. Um, Lawrence, please come join us. <laughs> um, just in the three buckets I've just mentioned, there's so much to unpack. So let me quickly dive into defining these different kinds of AI. Natural language processing, machine learning, and generative AI. Generative AI is a type of artificial technology that can be used to create new content, including text, imagery, audio, and synthetic data. When you think of generative AI, we can think of things like Canva, how they use their, pro their software to develop new images. Or we can think of ChatGBT, which also is combined with natural language processing. So let's move on to natural language processing. This is a field of AI where computer science meets linguistics to allow computers to understand and process human language. For that, you can think of when you're interacting with customer service chat, chat bots. And then finally, machine learning. 
Machine learning is a field that develops and uses algorithms and statistical models to allow computer systems to learn and adapt without needing to follow specific instructions. For that, you can think of things like facial recognition or self-driving cars. Within just these three types of AI, there are so many subcategories, but we'll stick to these broadly for the sake of time and clarity. Turning to legislation and regulation, any sort of legislation or regulation that creates policy that affects people must be developed with them and for them, ensuring that they not only have a seat at the development table, but also when and how policies are implemented. Joining us for today's conversation are esteemed panelists, Will Maria Escoto, Jessica Martinez, and Lawrence Emambolu. Will we hear from them? their stories and experiences about what it is like to interact with AI personally and professionally, and their suggestions on developing and incorporating responsible AI legislation. I invite you all in the audience as we start our discussion to create questions, and we will welcome questions later in the program. So with that, let me begin by introducing our speakers. So I will start with Wilmery. Wilmery serves as the policy counsel for Access Now, where her work centers on the intersection of data protection, privacy, emerging tech, and digital, digital rights. With a keen focus on algorithmic bias and the implications for marginalized and vulnerable communities, her expertise extends to pivotal areas such as AI, facial recognition, and surveillance capitalism. Wilmery is a licensed attorney in DC and holds a JD from the Howard University School of Law. Let's welcome Wilmery. I didn't turn this on before, so I hope everyone can hear me. Hi, everyone. My name is Wilmari. I also go by Mari. I, first off, I want to say thank you, Karen, for organizing this um, and inviting uh, me to join this discussion on such an important topic, um, the future of employment in an age coexisting with AI, the impact on the Latino workforce, and particularly some of the existing harms that we are currently seeing, and the risks posed by those AI systems on civil rights and economic opportunities. So we know that the workplace is challenging or is changing so rapidly, and our attention is rightly focused on the benefits and the risks of AI systems. Um, so a lot of the rhetoric is also focused on the existential harms of AI. But there are very real issues with the way AI systems are currently being used and deployed and how it's impacting the workforce now. And so in pursuit of efficiency, we're seeing employers developing, or pardon me, deploying AI tech that can track, that can monitor, that can surveil um, and evaluate workers in ways that were really previously un unimaginable, and it's done in a complete black box. There are two distinct areas that my comments today really focus on where AI harms are already being felt in the employment context and that I think are really ripe and important priorities for government intervention. So first is the use of AI to screen candidates and secondly is the use of, love the vibes, use of facial and emotion recognition tech to monitor um, workers and evaluate employee actions as well. I want to quickly just dispel one particular myth um, that AI can diminish hiring biases. The reality is that's not um, completely straightforward. When AI systems are biased, uh, they have devastating consequences. And most of the time, people rejected, unfairly rejected from a job, they may not have any idea or any awareness that the system was used to critique them, um, that they could have been discriminated against, or what remedies are available to them. And so I'll just plug in a quick report if there's anything you take away, right? We are in 2024. Remember back in 2018 when Amazon scrapped this AI hiring tool, it showed that it was more biased towards women than men. Um, just this year, I think it was like last month, uh, was a Bloomberg's report that highlighted that um, employers who are using ChatGPT currently um, uh, they found unintended biases for a preference for names typically associated with Asian applicants over those of black job seekers. So this is currently ongoing. And these type of discrepancies really underscore the nature of AI and recruitment and how when employers rely on these tools, it's not just impacting the communities, the individuals, but also the employers who are using these tools as well. 
there's a risk of Latino women to the workforce too um, when it comes to the preference of male candidates over women candidates, right? Bad data in, bad outputs. Um, and then similarly, facial recognition technologies and hiring processes. They've been critiqued as having higher error rates among people of color, among women, the elderly. There's issues as well with folks who are disabled. And so instead of leveling the playing field, these technologies can really perpetuate and amplify existing biases. So the next time someone wants to scare you about existential threats, ask them, well, what about the existing harms? How are we going to tackle those too, right? Put a little bit of pressure on folks. Um, and so as we really look to how to promote responsible innovation, it's really critical that we focus on both civil and human rights. And Karen alluded to this a little bit earlier, but um, narrowing the digital divide, ensuring equitable access to digital literacy, but also the technology, advocating for transparency and accountability, and making sure that these systems are des designed with um, diversity and inclusivity at their core. Um, I'm really excited to talk a little bit more about these things, and I'll hand it over. Thank you so much. Um, like you mentioned, AI and these conversations is not just one level, it's multifaceted and requires so much thought, um, not just specifically on employees, but employers um, with software and programs that are used also prior to the beginning of employment. So thank you so much for that. Um, let me now introduce Jessica Martinez. Jessica serves as the Executive Director for the U.S. Joint Economic Committee under Chairman Senator Martin Heinrich. In this role, she directs research and reports to the JEC Democratic staff and advises the Senator on economic policy. Prior to coming back to Capitol Hill, Jessica was a partner at a leading government relations and strategic communications firm focused on technology innovation. Let's welcome Jessica. Awesome. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jessica Martinez. Um, and as she just mentioned, Executive Director of the Joint Economic Committee uh, under the chairmanship of Senator Martin Heinrich. Um, before I even get into it, I'm so sorry. Thank you so much to CHCI and especially to Karen for putting together this panel. Uh, it's a really, um, really important topic. I'm super excited to be here. Uh, so the committee has traditionally been thought of as the think tank of Capitol Hill. And my team is very proud to continue that trend, uh, especially when it comes to topics like AI. Senator Heinrich is not only the chair of the Joint Economic Committee, but he's also the founder and co-chair of the Senate Artific Senate Artificial Intelligence Caucus. Last year, he, along with his Republican counterparts and Senate Majority Leader Schumer, hosted several roundtables to get a better understanding of the AI landscape. Those insight forums were exactly that. They were so helpful in shining a light on all things to consider when thinking through responsible AI policy. It was nuanced and it did not fall into partisan uh, corners. Uh, it was it, There was no real dogma there. It was really nice um, to see so much bipartisanship and, and so many people across the aisle coming in to talk about those issues. Uh, and that's something that I'd like to continue here today by centering three points on AI, um, the Latino workforce and federal policy. First is that AI is here and it's here to stay and we need to make sure that we maintain US leadership moving forward. This not only helps our national security, but it will also promote our economic security as well. And the Biden administration has provided a really good framework for the federal government uh, to use um, to help keep innovation here while keeping workers at the center of AI innovation. Second, when talking about AI, we need to use the active voice because AI is not some passive magical spell that's doing things on its own. Uh, there are people and intentions and incentives behind AI that keep it running, and we can't alleviate that responsibility uh, for just this technology that's going to be so transformative. The rapid rise of AI will alter nearly all aspects of society with large and uncertain impacts on the economy and labor market. Um, you know, in other words, like there's going to be a lot of disruption, and we we're still grappling on what and who and where and when that will be. Um, researchers have tried to pinpoint the sectors and locations of people who will negatively be impacted by AI, but it's hard to know exactly where they are um, at this point. Uh, what we do know though, is that people will be negatively impacted and the US needs to prepare for that. Some ways that the federal government can directly help AI transition is by help the AI transition is by utilizing unemployment insurance, uh, assisting in training and reemployment services, 
registered apprenticeships is huge, uh, and actually boosting union participation. Um, additionally, more data, more data collection on who is being displaced will help the government to better target resources to get those people the help they need. Uh, this isn't going to solely be a government solution. We will need the private sector, uh, academia, and nonprofits to help uh, be involved in this as well. Third, this is a critical time to shape our future with AI. In order to bring the Latino community in, we need to meet them where they are. That includes the digital literacy, that includes getting our basic needs of technology met across the country. Um, coordination between governments and a whole of government approach can help with that. It can help dispel myths and educate consumers on how AI is impacting their lives. Um, but AI can also help with this, right? We can use those tools uh, that can help with creating jobs and better infrastructure for our economic development, but we need to be intentional about bringing Latinos to the table for their input and catering to their unique needs. Finally, I was thinking of a good way to talk about generative AI that can be accessible to people who may not be uh, in the weeds as much on this issue. And I thought of the book series that my husband started reading my kids. Uh, I'm a millennial, so of course I'm gonna talk about Harry Potter. <laughs> in the first book, Harry comes across the mirror of Erised, which is a magical mirror that has the engraving I show not your face, but your heart's desire. AI does not show us the truth, but rather a prediction about what it was programmed to think we want to see with our own data that we provided. That doesn't make it good or bad, just another tool that humans can use. If you understand that, you'll be in a better position to think through best policy solutions that can curb AI's negative effects and bring it into a future where everyone can benefit from AI. Thanks again for having me here. <laughs> and I look forward to furthering conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Um, I also attended the uh, AI Insight Forum sessions and hundreds of pages later, it's still just scratching the surface. So thank you so much. And finally, please allow me to introduce Lawrence uh, Mbolu. Lawrence is the Senior Director of Data Science and Advanced Analytics at PepsiCo's Demand Accelerator Group. As a leader in his role, he manages a diverse team that develops digital solutions to enable human-centric decisions throughout the commercial life cycle of PepsiCo's consumers and products. Lawrence has served in various marketing and insight capacities where he played a crucial role in creating and implementing PepsiCo's industry-leading data and insights capabilities. Please welcome Lawrence. All right. Thank you and good morning. Thanks for having me here, Karen. And um, thank you to uh, my esteemed uh, co-panelists as well. Um, as you think about PepsiCo, I think you know a lot of people do not think about Pepsi as a tech-forward company or a company that leans into uh, digital. You think more about beverages, water, snacks. But you know what I'm here to share with you today not just um, uh, isn't just that PepsiCo leans into technology and generative AI, but it is a core component of our strat strategy and how we're going to continue to engage with our consumers moving forward. We are a consumer and human-centric company, and we take the responsibility of putting the consumers at the core of our strategy. We take that very seriously. And I would argue that when it comes to the future of generative AI and technology in our society, PepsiCo has a unique perspective that you wouldn't get from maybe a traditional tech company. We are at the center of where technology meets the workforce. As a company, PepsiCo has uh, over 250,000 employees. Majority of, of uh, those people are frontline workers. We have partnerships uh, with, with farmers in, in the agricultural sector. And so we are at the forefront of where this tech revolution, this AI and generative AI revolution is meeting real life use cases and enabling, um, enabling a lot of our frontline workers, a lot of our people in the field to uh, you know, take advantage of opportunities to be more efficient, to, be, uh, to eliminate mundane tasks that they, that they have and really changing what the future of work looks like uh, for our company and for our partners. 
as we think through today, um, there, there, you know, as we have this conversation today, there are a few things I'd like to uh, to leave with you or like you to think through uh, over the course of the conversation. Three things specifically. One is the importance of diversity in the entire life cycle of um, creating any sort of generative AI pro uh, product. This includes diversity of thought, people, skill set. Second is, uh, you, you know, understanding the role of the public sector and the private se sector in defining responsible use of data and generative AI for our society. All right, so I'm, I'm glad, you know, to be here representing, you know, a member of the, the private sector in this forum. I think as we continue to um, if we continue on this this uh, journey. It'll be critical to remain connected to define you know responsible rules, uh, to define rules for responsible use of generative AI and AI in in, in um, overall. And third, really, is just think, thinking about um, AI more broadly, including the community around the workforce that we're you know, we're trying to influence. So as we think about upskilling our, our, work for, uh, our workforce, how do we think about you know, taking a few steps back, um, thinking about the communities that these uh, individuals live in, thinking about um, the next generation, the younger generation of, of people and how you, you ensure that from early on education, they have access to the same opportunities, the same education, um, to leverage the power of the, the, the multiplicative power of generative AI whenever they, they come into the workforce down, down the line. And so lastly, through this forum today, I, I would say recognize all of, all of the, um, the risk around generative AI, but like you know, a couple of my panelists have mentioned today, this future is already here. I think the question now is how do we get our Latino workforce prepared to lean in and take advantage of this multiplicative effect of generative AI. Because like never before, Gen AI has the ability to, to level the playing field across multiple demographics of, of individuals. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. And to your point, the public and private sector partnerships and collaboration are crucial. So I'm so excited to have you all to reflect that, that relationship here at the table. And I'm very excited for this discussion to tease, to tease out these topics and, and questions. So we, at this point, we're gonna start with our Q&A session between myself and the panelists. I'll start off by asking a few questions. And as we do continue discussion, please take that time to formulate your own questions, um, things that might pop up as we continue our, our, our conversation. Um, there will be time for a Q&A towards the end where you are all welcome to share those questions. Um, but as we, before we begin our questions, I do just want to point out uh, a few facts that I think are very important to keep in mind. And you'll see this little paper floating around. It's just part of the, um, the policy brief. Within it, there's so much, but I want to highlight uh, a particular set of facts here. That Latinos are projected to account for 78% of new workers between 2020 and 2030. And the number of Latino workers in the labor force is projected to reach 35.9 million in 2030. And that data is likely not including data on undocumented Latino workers as well who provide a crucial lifeline to the workforce. So by 2030, one out of five workers will be Latino. Let me again uh, state that this was a projection between 2020 and 2030. So to the points that many of our panelists have already noted, this isn't a question of the future or what's going to happen. It's a conversation about what is currently happening. What do we have to talk about now to make up for what we haven't been talking about the last few years and how to best prepare for what is coming? So with that, let me start with our first question. Um, I'll open it up to any of you that would like to begin. But what is your first memory of knowingly interacting with AI, either personally or professionally? Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll start. I mean, <clears throat> I think the advent of ChatGPT was pretty huge. Uh, that was probably one of the biggest one of knowingly, knowingly doing it. Um, in, you know, very early onset, you know, using it as like, 
hey, can you draft up some round table, round table titles for a, you know, a hearing or something? Like uh, I remember using that um, just to see kind of what it would p- come up with. And uh, yeah, it was really, it was exciting and in- interesting and a little bit unnerving, to be honest. <laughs> For me, and this is going to help me a little bit. Um, so I am Nigerian, and I learned how to speak English, I guess. Uh, with my excuse later on in life was it was, it was still early. But um, uh, this is an area where, uh, you know, unlike most uh, Americans or actually even p- British people I grew up with, I had to spend extra time trying to translate things in my mind from my native language, Igbo, to, to English. And so Grammarly has been a lifesaver for me, right? And, and just making sure that, one, um, I'm not spending minutes or even, uh, you know, longer looking through res- presentations I'm putting together or emails I'm about to send out. Um, and of course, evolving from that, from Grammarly to what we're seeing with uh, ChatGPT. So Grammarly was my first one. So you actually stole mine. I, I was exposed to Grammarly in college, I'd say. Um, and when I was thinking about this, I actually had a really pleasant a, a memory come to mind um, of the first time understanding that there was to an extent, right, the, the concept of AI, and ironically, the concept of existential threat. So I was like eight or nine years old going from Florida to New York on the Greyhound with my parents. And back in the day, they used to have like these little televisions and the Greyhound and everyone would be watching the same movie. And of course, they had Terminator on. Yeah. So I was going <laughs> to say that, but then I was like... They had Terminator on and I was shook. Um, the following year, my parents took me to Hollywood Studios, and I don't know if anyone's gone, but they do a little video film, and they close the doors. I freaked out. I was like, we have to go. He's coming. He's coming. So that was my first thought. Um, but through Grammarly as well in college, um, and uh, I want to say like two or three years ago when Speechify came out. I don't know if y'all remember. I love setting it to Obama's voice. It's hilarious. Um, so when I feel like I'm strapped for time, I'll just uh, plug in something and then Obama will read it to me. Um, so I had been exposed to that a couple of years ago. Um, uh, so I, I think that kind of kick, kicked it off for me a little bit. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I used Grammarly to double check all of my emails to you. So, <laughs> um, so let's move on to, um, as I'm going to talk a little bit here, but um, what is the most surprising way you've heard of AI be used, specifically in the workforce? And as you think of your responses, let me supplement the question with this. A big concern with AI is that it will completely decimate the workforce, that machines will take over human labor, and that folks will be left without jobs. Latinos are often found in highest concentrations, not in traditional occupations that require tech or software like finance uh, or analytics, but rather in occupations related to farming, fishing, forestry. So we don't tend to think that they'll be impacted by softwares or machinery. But as we've seen, the numbers of Latinos entering STEM, uh, STEM studies has increased. So between 2012 and 2022, there was a 65% increase in Latino enrollment in science and engineering programs. So knowing that these fields will be more saturated with Latino workers, um, what do you think uh, is an appropriate response to this concern? Or if you'd like to begin with that first little thought, what is the most surprising way you think Latino workers will be using AI in the workforce? Um, I know that was a loaded question, so I'm happy to repeat, or if you would like to start, Jessica. Yeah, I can go ahead and go. So um, earlier this year, the Council of Economic Advisors had released their economic report of the president, and in it, they have a chapter on AI, and they talk about the different their projections on like how they're trying to identify who is getting impacted by AI, and the some of the some of the graphs and the the, um, the data suggests it's like really it's it's so hard to define because it's everyone right it's everyone and everywhere and it's not going to be all those people in that one sector it's going to be a specific job within that sector and it can get pretty um, uh, pinpointed very quickly but it is going to be 
on the low end of uh, income brackets, but also on the high end. Like there's going to be a lot of middle class uh, jobs that are going to be disrupted um, and as well as like some of those on the, on the low end um, income income brackets. So I think that that's uh, one thing to just keep in mind. I mean, it is, and it, it is scary, but it is, or it is, it, there is that fear of the unknown. But once you look at the applications and uh, understand, I think that, um, sorry, I want to take this in a little bit of a different direction. But one thing I would uh, recommend for uh, younger people is like, get, uh, um, take your time to experience what AI is, right? Like look at it, spend, you know, researchers suggest 10 hours of working through AI will give you a better sense of how that generative AI is actually working. And I think that those people who have a good handle on it at the outset where we are now are going to be better off later once that AI starts to become rapidly, rapidly advanced. And so you'll just, uh, making sure that there's a little bit of that education on the, on the front end can be super helpful. Um, one of the examples that I found was really interesting on AI is that, you know, uh, through farming, you mentioned farming, um, how AI can help with certain automation, but it still needs human interaction at certain checkpoints. And that is something that is just, it's not going to go away because you can try and automate humans completely out. If you do that in the long run, there will no longer be data that the AI can use. <laughs> so it, AI needs human interaction to be continuing uh, to advance. Um, and that's something that does make me feel better. Um, so I just would really like to build on, on the point you made around how necessary the labor force is, human beings, in this uh, entire AI journey. Um, interestingly, one of the things you hear happen, you know, happening at the same time, you know, around this AI conversation is around population, population growth, right? So on the one hand, you're talking about um, AI uh, eliminating the need for human beings. On the other hand, you're also hearing the conversation around concerns of population growth and the need for more people. So I want to build on, you know, one of the points we just heard, which is you need both in this future we're, we're talking about. The question again really is how will work change versus necessarily be eliminated. So the opportunities that, that, will, that will come from the use of generative AI. And so for me, as I think about the most surprising way I've, I've seen, I've heard AI use, unfortunately, this is not a plug, it's a PepsiCo example. And I work with some, some amazing people and it is an area of agriculture. It, and it is a, around how, how are you enabling better yields for farmers we work with? Um, in their day-to-day, -day, uh, um, you, you know, in their day-to-day -day life, from how they're planting the products to harvesting, going back for the up cycle to thinking about how do you initiate or leverage generative AI in preventive maintenance. Your equipment is going to break down. How do we alert you to that so you don't waste an entire days of work with the broken down equipment and you you stay ahead of these things, uh, replacing your parts and your technology. And partnering with those people because guess what? That benefits us also downstream. So it's a symbiotic re relationship as I talked about this idea of community across, across the board for the worker, for the company, for the public. I absolutely agree um, with my co-panelist. I... Um, love the point that Jessica made about uh, the need for human interaction and, and the opportunities to really think about how to coexist with this technology, not just displacement. And I love the statute that you threw out in the beginning as well, because I think it really paints the picture of how profound these implications are. It's expected that by 2030, there's going to be over 7 million new Latino workers and when you look at the stark underrepresentation and a lot of tech roles, it really highlights barriers to entry and advances in the sector and in many other sectors. I think 
what I found most interesting, and Jessica and I spoke about this briefly, is like when you start looking into the studies assessing the impacts on specific demographics, I have found, I won't say contradictions, but the math isn't mathing, right? I have questions. <laughs> I need follow-up. So um, just to give you an example, um, to Jessica's point about kind of the spectrum of who's impacted, right? There was a 2023 Pew Research Center study, and it found that certain groups of workers have higher levels of exposures to AI. Those with more education, workers with a bachelor's degree were 27% or more, look, workers with a bachelor's degree or more, 27%, are more than twice as likely as those with a high school diploma, only 12% in most exposures, right? As when it comes to women, a greater share of women, 21% than men, 17%, are likely to see the most exposure in AI. And that's because of the differences in types of jobs held by men and women. Asian and white, Asian 24%, white 20% workers, so Asian and white workers are more, explored, more exposed than black and Hispanic workers in that study, right? But then I read another one and then I have questions. Um, uh, higher workers, higher wage workers are also at greater risks. So what does that mean taking a, picture, a big step out, right? We know that Latinos are incredibly ambitious, especially the children of immigrants, right? We love education. We pursue higher education opportunities. So what does that mean? Um, how will uh, Latinos pursuing higher education, getting these jobs, how will that impact us? Whether you have that higher education, if you're a Latina woman, um, if you're a higher wage worker. Um, according to that same study, it said that Black, Hispanic, and American Indian or Pacific Island workers are more likely than, bless you, than other racial and ethnic groups to be employed in the least exposed jobs. That's a mouthful. Why did they do a study on least exposed, highest exposed? And I had printed out the, the um, charts and it was, it was quite interesting. Like the, keep in mind that most likely, least likely, it still means you will be exposed, right? But the nuances of how that's going to come into fruition. So some of the most likely occupations to have higher exposure were arch mm, sorry, architectural and civil drafters, billing and posting clerks, biological technicians, bookkeeping, computer hardware engineers, credit analysis, data entry keyers, mm, wait for this one, judicial law clerks, medical transcriptionists, paralegals and legal assistants, the list goes on. If you look at Folks who are most likely to have a medium level of exposure, chief executives, education and child care administrators, fashion designers, that caught me by surprise, um, human resource managers, medical scientists, school psychologists, veterinarians, that also took me by surprise, but kind of makes sense in some capacity. And then the ones that were most likely to have low exposure. Again, this still means there will be exposure to what extent? Someone please explain to me. Barbers, child care workers, dishwashers, fence erectors, firefighters, maids and housekeeping cleaners, nursing assistants, right? So all of these jobs are near and dear to my heart. I'm a Dominican American. I'm an immigrant from the Dominican Republic. When I was very young, my mother and father worked at a plant nursery. So I would actually take my Harry Potter books and read underneath the tree and they would be in the, in the fields, right? Um, my mother became a tax preparer later on. I worked in, cust uh, in client services for an energy company uh, doing, uh, ¿cómo se dice? Um, call services, like it was a call center. Um, I'm an attorney, right? All these issues come up. So it's quite interesting. I think that there's a need for more, inform uh, more information in, in kind of those nuances. Um, and then the last point that I just wanted to quickly point out is... Um, I found, I found this interesting as well. Uh, most of the 43 U.S. members of the Forbes AI 50 list have their headquarters located in Cali, Texas, Massachusetts, and New York, three of which have significant Latino populations and two being major Latinos, um, and two being major Latino populations. So there's a lot of opportunity for Latino engagement in the, in the AI landscape. Um, we are incredible entrepreneurs, the stats I was looking into regarding um, uh, our entrepreneurship, uh, it accounts for 50% of net small businesses over the past decade. During the COVID, um, Latinos had exceptional growth in their businesses, increasing revenue by 25% outpacing white-owned counterparts. So it just really talks to that entrepreneurial spirit and the opportunities, you know, if we train, educate, 
provide opportunities for Latino entrepreneurs as well. They have an opportunity to really maximize the the benefits that that the that AI has in some ways. Thank you. Um, I want to now move on to a quick question on data. We're close to Q and it's like an audience Q and A, so prepare your questions. Um, but I want to touch on data before we get there. So to everyone's comment on farming, I recently went to uh, an ag sort of AI situation and John Deere was there and they shared with me their precision egg technology. So they have a sort of like collection and software program that uses AI to monitor and forecast things like field conditions, um, you know, crop conditions, all those kinds of things. And I found that fascinating because we don't often put AI and farming together. But of course, we see a lot of Latino laborers in the farming space, not just actual physical labor, but now have to analyze. Um, so to the point of data, what role do data, data sovereignty and privacy play in this AI conversation? So what are your thoughts on the impacts on Latino communities in considering the importance of data usage and training and using AI and privacy of data and knowledge? Um, and we can start with Wilmarie if, if you'd like, unless someone else is ready. I can go. I mean, th that's a that's a huge question. <laughs> um, very exciting. Uh, the one thing um, I did want to mention. Sorry, before. Oh, shoot, I'm losing my train of thought now because I have so many. You you said a uh, privacy, and now I'm like unlocking. You know, you said AI precision AI. I remember that bill from five or six years ago. I mean, it's a uh, it's really. It's pretty cool to see the fruition of uh, where, you know, bills on Capitol Hill come. And as they move forward, you can see the trend like they do have real life impacts um, in different in communities. And the farming um, precision um, agriculture is, is a really good example of that. But you had mentioned the idea of uh, that there will be more work in that space. I mean, that's, I think, exactly the piece. It's voting. <laughs> um that is that is what we're talking about, right? When we say that there's going to be a disruption, some of those workers are no longer going to be needed because AI is there, but you're going to need a new set of skills to come in to replace it. So it's not going to be necessarily that all jobs are going to be lost. It's just that they're going to be different. And how do you make sure that that time frame from when people are who are on the short end, right, of that stick and get and, and a need to find another job or need to reskill or need to even like location base, right? Like there's certain regions that are just going to be more apt to, to carry on more people uh, incoming than, um, than certain areas based on their like economic, you know, urban development. Um, so that was, that's like kind of a, a big thing. I just wanted to flag that that was like when we talk about the disruption and the changes in job and, and working, um, you brought up data and bringing up, uh, privacy, it's really hard not to want to talk about uh, in the Latino community, especially for Web2, which is like more the social media and um, the, the lane that we were in just a few years ago, uh, how impactful that was to the economy um, and how hard it was to see that the Latino community did not reap a lot of the benefits that it should have because we were over indexed on consuming a lot of uh, what was being put out there in terms of, um, you know, social media and just online content. And we weren't those creators. We weren't the ones who were, you know, putting forth some of those new uh, thoughts and ideas and, and um, out into the world. And I, I think that, you know, AI is coming in. You can see that there's a shift. Um, and just going on to your statement on the entrepreneurial spirit, Latinos are like, um, I, it's actually, it's it's Black women and Latino women who are small business owners, like who are during the pandemic had large numbers, huge spikes in entrepreneurial, um, in growing their businesses. Um we need supports for them because some of that waned. Uh, so we gotta, we gotta help our sisters out when, uh, when the time comes for uh, congressional action. But I think um, it was just a really good, ex it, was, it was a highlight and it was something to see on uh, the, the Web2 front on how much data is being collected on people and like where those benefits are going. Um, and we saw that in Web2. I think that that's a really big reason why people are looking at um, AI and, and feeling the pressure that, you know, you ha we have to do something now. 
uh, we have to do, we have to, you know, pass some sort of legislation, make those hard decisions. You're not going to please everybody, but you're going to need to make something happen so that we don't see ourselves um, kind of in the space that we're in now with a huge, you know, data collections and all that. Sure, thank you. Um, if Lawrence or Wilmarie would like to. Okay. Yeah, I love that you brought it back to um, placing those fears in kind of a broader context and really how to maximize on them. I think that the narrative that AI will kind of like obliterate jobs completely, it captures the public's imagination and it goes a little bit to that, that existential threat, but it detracts from a lot of those immediate and tangible issues that I've raised um, with AI, particularly the biases embedded in those AI-driven hiring processes. Um, I think that the ingrained biases, those are a lot of the present dangers today and how that ties into data is, is also really critical. So I think it's important to remember that AI um, itself is not inherently exclusionary. If you want to get rid of all AI bias, you're going to have to also get rid of all people. Um, and so just remember that it's a product of flawed decisions and um, systems. And when it comes to data, the concern lies in those data sets that are used to train those AI models, um, the choice of the models, the training processes. Um, if those databases contain bias, then it's going to, the results are going to exhibit those biases as well. Um, I think about this quite often, right, because Latinos are not a monolith, right? You have Afro-Latinos, you have Indigenous Latinos, and we are not all the same and we do not look all the same. Um, and so when you think about how folks are developing algorithms today and how they're being trained on historical data that kind of perpetuates these stereotypical biases um, and systemic inequities, you can really see the danger that lies. Um, Latinos, we always talk about like... Uh, what is that saying we love to use? Como se dice? Like, um, we want to see ourselves in positions, right? Like, you can't get somewhere without seeing yourself somewhere. I can't remember the, the saying right now, uh, but I feel like you know what I'm talking about. Um, and so I, I thought a really interesting example was that um, uh, there was one system um, where when you were searching for images of individuals um, from California, Texas, and Florida, and New York, despite the, <laughs> the, the significant demographic of Latinos there, um, AI-generated images often fail to include Latinos. Um, the photo of a Californian um, or a Floridian was like a surfer, blonde hair dude. Um, and I went to FIU in Miami, and that is not the case. We are a melting pot. There are Venezuelans, there are Brazilians, there are Dominicans, there are Cubans. We are everywhere. I love it. Um, and so thinking about those states, California and Texas, uh, with the highest percent of Latinos, however, um, I think it was like only one brown individual uh, was seen out of all of the six people that that came up. Um, yeah, Same with input and output. Um, thank you for that. I do want to give Lawrence a chance to briefly respond before we move on to audience Q&A, so please prep your questions. Uh, I'll make mine quick. Um, so there's a Denzel Washington interview um, I was watching a few years back that talked about culture and why it's important to have um, a director from a certain demographic represent, like I, I guess, the, the context of the substance of a movie they're directing, right? He talked about um, a black director uh, directing a, a you know, um, African-American movie and the reason why isn't because any other director from a different demographic cannot do a similar job or good job, but it's, he talked about culture and the context and nuances of knowing, for example, the smell of, um, you know, in, in the kitchen when you have a hot comb in a black girl's hair, right? And just some very subtle things that you can include in a movie that makes it hit home, like truly trying to represent what uh, the message you're trying to convey. I bring, uh, you know, I think a similar idea exists in the world of generative AI, data science, and use of data. And you know, for me, this this hits home um, as I think about my role as a leader, as I think about uh, building teams, as I think about finding the best talent. As I mentioned earlier, in terms of thinking, people. Um, and skill sets. 
because of those nuanced reasons, because you need people thinking about things that I'm not thinking about, right? Because you need, um, yeah, they need me in the room bringing perspectives, um, even from, from an immigrant's perspective, right? So I think the role diversity has, uh, has to play in responsible use of data cannot be uh, minimized at all. In parallel, I'll, I'll bring up my, what keeps me up at night really is this idea of responsible use of data. Like a lot of our information is out there. Recently, you saw what's happening with um, Writers Guild in, in California and you know, people's IP just being taken and used. There are no ground rules set and the, the technology is moving at a faster pace than legislation. So again, really making sure that public and private sectors really come together to define what those rules are. Um, and I, uh, you know, as we're having this conversation today, make sure that um, the Latino workforce and uh, is prepared to tap into these opportunities that are coming up um, as well. Um, can I add one point to that? Sorry, as you just said, can I really quick? Very quickly. Right. Sorry. Very quickly. <laughs> I just wanted to make a note, you know, as you said, look at in the Latino force, um, that, you know, in 2019, U.S. resident AI PhD graduates, 3.2% were Latino, were Hispanic. You know, 2.4% were Black, and 19% were women. So in terms of education, like you just, you know, that does that's not a reflection that we don't have people who want to go in or who want to be a part of that uh, and be the next AI researchers. It's showing that, you know, we have blind spots in the government and we need to meet them where they are. <laughs> That's, that's what that says. Great, thank you so much. So it is now time for audience Q&A. And in order to maximize the amount of questions that we may have, if one panelist could answer per question, that would be great. Um, so if we could start, if anybody has a question. Hi, my name is Sarai. So I, I got a question because uh, I have a perception that in the Hispanic community, I can see a stigma against the AI. And I'd like to know your position or your advice related how the civil organi civil society organization can tackle this, you know, uh, issue, you know, in the, the, that community can, you know, embrace that as opportunity, you know, that like, a, I don't know, any threat that they, that is my question. I, what I'll say is um, what I found with anything new, including just in the workforce and you know where I sit, is there always is a fear of what you don't know, right? So as I sit here today, my job didn't exist a decade ago. My job is not going to exist in the future. I have a baby on the way. I'm going to be a first-time dad. I really have to upskill myself, right? So. <laughs> Um, my thinking is different now, but it, it's also coming, like all of these changes also come in at such a great time where access to information and education is just asymmetric. Like you have access to resources in colleges and all uh, digital platforms you can leverage to really upskill yourself. Companies like, like us and my team are leaning in, into that approach as well. Most importantly, um, you know, I think as, as Jessica mentioned um, on a point earlier, is how do you meet people where they are? How do you make AI less scary, right? As you partner with, you, you know, um, with um, folks in, in the community, how do you how do you make how do you remove any cost pre prohibitions for them, right? In leaning into and leveraging technology. So as you know, for um, Initiatives that we're, you know, we're, we're um, piloting on, on our end is enabling communities by uh, leveraging technology with them, upskilling them, like stores and uh, in businesses and farmers we work with, helping educate and upskill them so that this idea of generative AI is no longer a stigma, is no longer scary, but is really just part of their uh, everyday lives for those store owners or those farmers but now for generations behind them that uh, within their community, within their household. 
Thank you, Lawrence. Um, next question. Thank you. My name is Leticia. Um, my question is, how can we maximize the benefits of AI in the daily basis, but also how do we protect our safety and privacy? I think that the first, to answer your question, number one, we need targeted investments in our education and our workforce development to really meet the demands for, for the driven economy. I think your question goes to something that I was thinking just a moment before in regards to how do you empower people, um, the concept of fear, right? So earlier I, I threw out some stats and I said that because I want to hype us up, right? We have an entrepreneurial spirit. We're out here. We're brilliant. <laughs> um, and so I think getting getting that buy-in is a little bit difficult um, for folks to, to understand and empower. I think that we don't just need formal education and training and just those technical skills. But um, earlier I talked about our entrepreneurial spirit. So how to how can the government better support um, innovation and entrepreneurship within within the community? I think it's important to look at it at a, as a bigger picture as to what you can contribute and kind of our role in um, the United States' uh, economic fabric and how there's a really strong argument that the inclusion of Latino, of the Latino cohort in an AI-driven world, it isn't just about... Um, our prosperity, but for like the nation's competitiveness on edge as well. So I think that 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 is more of um, a, a multifaceted approach. I, and the last thing I will say is you don't know what you don't know, right? So making things um, easy to digest, helping people understand that there are civil rights and human rights things at risk that... Um, it's okay to ask an employer if they're using AI tools um, to to hire you. Uh, the transparency aspect and the accountability aspect that we're seeing right now is, is very lackluster. There, it's a black box. There's not a lot of information out there. Um, and I think just elevating to our younger generation the importance of being in the room, the importance of holding leadership positions, and all that also goes into the, the private industry as well, not just having a Latino or a Black person in the room, but that their word carries weight, right? Um, and so I think, yeah, I, th I think I think that covers it to an extent. I think there's a lot that the government should invest in the Latino cohort. I also think that there's a lot that we can maximize if, if we really take a look at our power. Um, but um, I don't like to put the burden on people just to, you know, folks throughout digital literacy, like, oh, you can just learn. That's not necessarily the case. There are language barriers. There are lots of issues. Um, so I think it's really important to continue partnering with stakeholders to elevate grassroots organizations. Um, United We Dream is one organization that does a lot of um, immigrant work as well. So um, Access Now partners with different organizations like that. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one more question, which is perfect because Jessica, you'll get a chance to answer. Um, but if anyone has one final question, and I promise they'll stick around for some questions afterwards. I'm, I'm very loud, so I won't use this. That's okay. I appreciate that. Um, 
Yeah, thank you. I, it, it's hard. It's an up, you know, uphill battle. Um, I think oftentimes, especially with something that we've seen uh, shaped by Hollywood and the tech industry, right? Like on AI. Uh, I, yeah, I wanted to mention a movie like I, 2001, Space Odyssey. Like how is the first AI? And Homeboy was so scary. <laughs> like he, um, we're not there yet, but I think that sometimes the paralysis of fear leaves people to inaction, which is still in action, right? And we've seen that time and time again. Um, and I'm just going to keep using attitude, like ugh, sayings upon sayings upon sayings. But it's like, you know, the first, the best time to make a decision was like at that moment, the second best time is now. And, um, you know, I, so I know that we talk about the pressure of doing something now um, that is real. And it just, it doesn't matter that, uh, you know, like that, it, that this technology, you know, the chat GPT came out last year. Like that doesn't mean that we can't look at it, look back on it a little bit um, because we're still going to be needing those guidelines and regulations, as you said, in the future. Um, it's going to be helpful. I, I think oftentimes as a uh, ledge staff, it is always helpful to provide options. Um, you know, I think I would say a lot of our roles are to help give our members and our principals um, more lay of the land to give them all the information that they need to make those decisions, right? So it's uh, letting them know, hey, you know, th this uh, the privacy bill had come out. Looking at those section by section, you know, stating like, this is where we are. If we choose to vote on this, this is the outcome. This is what we're going to see. If we do not, this is also the outcome. So making sure that they know that what the outcome is if we don't do anything, because that is still, uh, we see it time and time again in, in other um, sectors that, you know, by not uh, investing in things, we lose, you know, we kind of, we kind of lose our eye on um we lose sight a little bit of, of what can be gained from it. Um, so I, I really do try to just provide them with those options and letting them know that like this is, yeah, I'm just reiterating what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. Um, we stand in between the audience and lunch. So in order to get there, uh, we're just going to move down to our takeaways. And we'll start here and move down towards you, Lawrence. But if you all, and for the sake of time, consider what you would like the audience to take away from this panel um, in like a, a one minute blurb. What would you want to really emphasize um, and have, fo have folks keep close to them as we continue these AI discussions? Absolutely. Um, yeah, I'm happy to start. Yeah, I think what's important is that um, we really need a robust framework that mandates um, uh, bias mitigation strategies. We need transparency from AI tool developers and deployers um, from throughout the entire life cycle. And we need to ensure that diverse uh, perspectives are at every stage of AI development and implementation. Um, this means we need to compel companies to audit their systems for fairness and bias. Um, we need to make sure that black and brown folks are in the teams that design, develop, and audit those technologies. We need a comprehensive federal data privacy regulation. We need to prohibit all forms of biometric surveillance. We didn't get a chance to talk about emotion recognition technology that's being used in videos, but that's extremely problematic pseudoscience BS. And so there's also many things that I could point out. The need for human right impacts assessments. We need transparency, preserving human alternatives, and civil society, engage, civil society engagement. Um, and lastly, I'll just say that, you know, the conversations involving Latino communities um, uh, when it comes to AI and automation is vital. We need to understand our needs, our specific concerns, our aspirations to really drive targeted and effective solutions. And that can take a lot of forms from forums, community forums to workshops. Um, so we have to, again, place our Latinos in positions of leadership and influence to really take into consideration those cultural differences and demographics. Yeah, uh, that's a, it's so hard because <laughs> AI, uh, we were talking before this uh, briefing started, like it's just ubiquitous in everything now. Like a everything is AI. And so as uh, my colleague was just pointing out, you know, there's a lot of different directions you can go in. And so I would try and pull it back and just as you're here um, on Capitol Hill thinking through, you know, those, those three points that I had mentioned, you know, just like, well, actually, I, I will go in a different direction and state that 
just like the Washington DC machine, it takes time. 